So Matthew chapter 17, starting at verse 24. After Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax came to Peter and asked, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he does, he replied. When Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. What do you think, Simon, he asked. From whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? From their own sons or from others? From others, Peter answered. Then the sons are exempt, Jesus said to him. But so that we may not offend them, go to the lake and throw out your line. Take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. Thank you very much, Emma. Good morning, everybody. Well, as Nathan uh, said, we come this morning to the end of our 10-week series in Matthew. And we arrive, don't we, at this strange little story about the fish with a coin in its mouth. It's unusual for a number of reasons. Uh, Matthew is the only one of the four gospel writers to include it. You might be interested to know that it's the only time that fishing with a hook is mentioned in the New Testament. And in one sense, it's a small kind of miracle, isn't it? It's a bespoke miracle. One fish, one coin, one man. But at the same time, it's staggering and it's utterly unique. It's an act of God. But perhaps most surprising of all, and the most interesting question that we need to ask is why Matthew chooses to include this section at the conclusion of this section of his gospel. You may remember that Matthew has carefully planned his whole account of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus around five teaching sections, interspersed with five narrative or action sections. Abby, I wonder if I'm a little loud. I'm sounding loud to myself. I don't know about anybody else. Uh, but I can speak up if I feel people are straining at the back. So Matthew has uh, carefully planned his whole account of the life death and resurrection of Jesus around five teaching sections and you may remember that he's interspersed them with five action sections. The middle teaching section is the collection of seven parables in chapter 13 that we studied in September and so the third action section is the one that begins in 1353 and goes all the way to 1727 which is the part of the gospel we've been studying this term. In other words, Matthew is a very careful compiler of his material. And as we come to the end of this third action section, we can take it as read that he has not just stuck this story of the fish there because he had nowhere else to put it. We can take it as read, I think, that he has made this a deliberate and fitting conclusion, perhaps even a climax, perhaps even a summary of everything he has said so far in this section. And therefore, I want to suggest to us this morning that if we understand the fish, we will understand something very important indeed. But before we look at it, we need to zoom out and look at the bigger picture, which is, in Matthew's Gospel, the two kingdoms. This is one of the keys to understanding Matthew's Gospel, is to understand the two kingdoms and the relationship between them. On the one hand, there is the kingdom of men, the earthly kingdom, the kingdom that's referred to in this passage. And then in contrast, and you'll see this coming right in chapter 18, verse 1, the kingdom of heaven. And in Matthew, the kingdom of heaven is one of his distinct phrases or emphases. The other gospel writers Mark, Luke, and John all prefer the phrase the kingdom of God. 
Matthew alone substitutes it for the kingdom of heaven. And I think that's because he is particularly keen to, to make us understand the contrast between the two. There is the kingdom of heaven and there is the kingdom of earth. This is the nature of reality. This is the universe in which we live. Well, let's look at a, a famous example. Just to leave something in Matthew 17. Just flip back, if you would, to chapter 6. And the page numbers are on the screen if you need them. Just to back a few chapters. Back in chapter 6, Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray by using what has become a very familiar and famous prayer, the Lord's Prayer. Um, it's not actually a prayer to kind of say verbatim necessarily. It is more of a framework of how to pray in all circumstances. In fact, it's even more than that. Really, it's a framework for the whole of Matthew's Gospel. It's a kind of basic framework of his theology. Take this prayer into your bloodstream and you start to think like God. Well, notice that the prayer is sandwiched between references to our Father in heaven. 6 verse 1. Jesus warns against doing good deeds to be seen by men, but to do them to be seen by your Father in heaven who rewards you and sees everything you do. Then in 6.14, Jesus encourages forgiveness towards men who sin against you so that your Father in heaven will forgive you. So either side of the Lord's Prayer are practical examples of how belonging to the kingdom of heaven will impact your behavior in the kingdom of men. If you have a Father in heaven who sees what you do and rewards you and forgives you, that will change the way you live, won't it? And this is really the key to our understanding of Christian discipleship. This is the life that Jesus' disciples are going to lead. They are going to be caught between these two kingdoms. They're going to find themselves in a kind of a, a, a tension between these two realities, between the kingdom of earth and the kingdom of heaven. Well, in between those two references, look at what Jesus teaches his disciples in verses 9 to pray, 10. He says, this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus' disciples are to pray for the realities in heaven to become realities on earth. For God's name to be honored. For God's will to be done on earth as in heaven. In other words, the fundamental request of the Lord's Prayer is for the kingdom of God to come to earth. And that is a big prayer, isn't it? A prayer for the present world order, this kingdom of sinful humanity in opposition to God, to finally give way to God's rule, to God's perfect kingdom, so that his will may be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I want to suggest that this is the key, the paradox, the tension of the Christian life. Because we find ourselves in both kingdoms, don't we? We live now in the kingdom of men. We live in the kingdom of death and taxes, as someone has said. But we know that this kingdom will be superseded one day by the kingdom of God. That is why we pray for the kingdom to come. We are part of the kingdom of earth. This is our present home. But it's not our loyalty, our hope, our status, our destiny, our identity is in the kingdom of heaven. And that explains some of the oddities of the Christian life that we've seen. Some of the things we've been talking about earlier. The fact that glory comes through suffering. The fact that we die in order to live. Because we live in the overlap of those two kingdoms. The Christian life is so strange, so uncomfortable, and yet so brilliant. It explains, doesn't it, why the Christian life is sometimes very hard and costly. But it's also so wonderful that no Christian would want to swap it for anything else. So that's a, a bit of a bigger picture context. Let's turn back to Matthew 17 and we'll see how this helps us 
uh, with what is actually uh, quite a tricky little passage. So let's pray for God's help as we turn to the details. Father, we do thank you for speaking to us in your word. We thank you that your word is so often surprising, puzzling, arresting. Thank you that it stretches us. And we pray now for the help of your spirit as we turn to these words and this rather surprising episode of the tax and the fish. We pray that it might change our hearts and help us to see things your way and to live now as people who belong to your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'll put three headings on the sheet, and the first is the kingdom, the king of heaven. Have a look again at verse 24. After Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax came to Peter and asked, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? So this episode is prompted by the tax collector's calling, but it's important not to confuse this tax and these tax collectors with the other kinds of taxes and tax collectors that often get mentioned in the Gospels. This is completely different, and this section has nothing to teach us about our attitude to modern governments or what we think about what the Chancellor did last Thursday. This tax was not paid by the Jews to the Romans, which is all those other tax references in the Gospels, but this was their own tax for the upkeep of their own temple. It was first established by Moses in Exodus 30 and then reinstated by King Joash in 2 Chronicles 24 and it went to the upkeep of the physical building of the temple and the infrastructure that went on there and the animal sacrifices that went on there. It's actually a very simple tax involving an annual payment of half a shekel, which is two drachmas, just once a year for every adult male Jew. And in case you're interested, two drachmas is roughly, apparently, about two days wage for the average laborer. And unlike the Roman tax, most people paid this tax with great pleasure. In fact, it was seen with a matter of national pride to pay it. After all, here is an opportunity not to send your money to Rome, but to make a contribution to the temple of God, the, pray, the place in all the world where the God of heaven had chosen to dwell, where God himself was worshipped. So this tax is a good tax. It's one that every Jew actually was glad to pay. Well, with that background in mind, it's hard to know what prompted the question that is now put to Peter about Jesus. Was it a test? Had there been rumors that he had a controversial attitude to the tax? Or was he simply late paying it? Well, the most likely reason is the one hinted at in verse 1, that you see Jesus has been away from Capernaum from, for some time and has now returned to Capernaum and has not yet had a chance to make his contribution. So it's probably a simple matter of timing. Whatever the reasons and the motivation for the question, Peter could not be more straightforward in his answer. Look at verse 25. Does he pay the tax? Yes, he does, he replied. Well, Peter then goes indoors, and I think what's probably going through his mind is having been prompted by the tax collectors, he's going to prompt Jesus give him a gentle prod before he falls behind with his payment. But Jesus, with the kind of knowledge that belongs to God, is already aware of the conversation, and he gets in first. When Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. What do you think, Simon, he asked? From whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? From their own sons or from the sons of others? From others, Peter answered. Then the sons are exempt, Jesus said to him. It's now that we begin to see that this little episode is 
going to teach us something much bigger than paying tax. It is, in the first instance, about the identity of Jesus and his relationship to the temple. Jesus uses a simple analogy to make that point. He says, in a traditional monarchy, kings collect taxes, but they don't pay taxes. I, I, I can't remember where our royal family are up to in this, but I have a feeling that they do pay taxes, but that is a historical anomaly. It's probably a, a function of the fact that they are, find themselves in a modern Western democracy and they're under pressure from people and the governments and newspapers to pay taxes, but actually it's a strange thing for a monarchy to pay taxes, especially in the ancient world. In the ancient world, in a traditional monarchy, in a proper monarchy, you might say, no, the kings collect taxes. Why would they pay taxes? And why would they charge their own children taxes? And so, seeing as we're talking here about the temple tax, not the income tax, the implication is clear, isn't it? Can you follow Jesus' logic? See what he is saying about himself. If earthly kings do not pay taxes or charge taxes to their children, then neither does the king of heaven pay tax in his own temple or tax his own children. And so here we have as big a claim of Jesus as anywhere in the gospel. He's saying he has no obligation to pay the tax because, as he said in Matthew 12, verse 6, one greater than the temple is here. He is greater than the priests, greater than the temple, greater than the sacrifices, all the worship of the temple, every penny that comes into the temple, it all belongs to him. He is the king of the temple. He is the Lord of heaven. And so he owes no one anything. And so here then is a big claim as big a claim as anything Jesus has said so far. Here in the temple in Jerusalem is the place where God has chosen to dwell in all the earth. And Jesus says, this is my father's house. I'm at home here. I owe nothing. But the king of heaven. But notice that Jesus refers to sons, doesn't he, in the plural. Or you might have, if you've got a slightly more updated version, you might have children. And notice that the word, the miracle that the fish provides is a tax of a four drachma coin. It is for Peter and himself. And so secondly, in this section, we need to see the sons of the king of heaven. Have a look again at the miracle, verse 27. Go to the lake and throw out your line. Take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you'll find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. Let's think about this miracle a little bit more. Jesus has done some spectacular miracles throughout the Gospels. He's done a few miracles involving fishing. He's done some big miracles involving provision, hasn't he? Thinking of the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, bread and fish. But this miracle, I think, is in a class of its own. Notice that it doesn't involve healing or sorting out a life-threatening situation. In fact, you could hardly say it was urgent, could you? I mean, it is nice to have your tax paid, isn't it? It is nice to have the extra couple of drachmas, but I don't think this is life-changing, is it? It would be, I guess, the equivalent of having that little heating subsidy, you know, the government's giving us all 66 quid a month or something. It's, it's really nice to have. Or maybe 5% off your council tax bill or something like that. It's, it's nice to have, isn't it? But it's not life-changing. It's not game-changing. And presumably, if he wanted to, Jesus could have found the mo money another way. There were women, we're told, who supported his needs, Peter was a fisherman. He could have gone and caught a whole load of fish and sold them, got his tax legitimately that way. 
And of course, if Jesus wanted to, he could have caught a boat full of fish with coins in their mouths and Peter could have been rich. It is, in fact, a very targeted and specific miracle, isn't it? It's absolutely tailored to the need of the moment. It produces just the right amount of money for a specific purpose from a unique and unprecedented source. So it's a funny one, isn't it? It's a small miracle. One man, one fish, one coin. But it's an amazing work of God. We need to understand that this is not just a quick way out of a tricky situation. And it's not just a, a trick, you know, like the grandfather sort of pulling a coin from the, the child's ear. Now what this is, as Matthew concludes his section that has come all the way from the end of chapter 13, this is a teaching miracle. Here is a lesson in what it means to be a son of the king of heaven teaches what it means to belong to he who has the world under his control. Now let me illustrate this kind of control, and this illustration is going to date me, but never mind. Uh, when I was a child, I think maybe, I don't know, six, seven or eight, the time of life where these days, I guess, some parents would be giving their children a, a phone or some screen or something, whether that's wise thing or not, you can discuss over coffee. But when I was this age, I think in a Christmas stocking, I received something that, that was about the size of a phone, looked like a phone. Of course, phones didn't enter our heads. They weren't around. It was perhaps a precursor to a kind of computer game console. And what it was was a, 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 a little miniature town made of plastic. And inside the town, there was a little car and you could control the car with magnets. Anyone have a game like that? Didn't take much to keep us happy in those days. <laughs> and it would sit in the palm of your hand and you could make the car move around the town by using these little thumb wheels. And I thought it was absolutely brilliant. It kept me out of trouble for hours and hours. And I think what I loved about it was the feeling of control. Because you could make the car go anywhere you wanted. You could go the wrong way up the one-way street. You could drive on the wrong side of the road. You could crash into things. You could go around the roundabout as many times as you wanted. I know it's not much, is it? And children these days might be thinking, wow, that's, that's, pretty, <laughs> that's pretty small thrills. But we were happy. <laughs> and I think what I loved about it was just the sense of power. That here in the palm of my hand was was my little world. And I could control this little car and I could make it go wherever I wanted it to. Now scale that up and think what it means to be Jesus. To be the, the king of his world. To be the king of heaven, ruling the king of earth, the kingdom of earth. So that every fish of the sea is under his control. Every coin that has ever been minted belongs to him. The money is his. The seas are his. The temple is his. The cattle on a thousand hills are his. All belongs to him. This is what it means to be the king of heaven, to be in control of every square inch of the created order and to be able to work out his purposes for the good of his children. If you start to think about that, you realize that this is quite challenging because it actually divides humanity. See, if you are the son of the king, one of these disciples who have put a little bit of faith in Jesus, or if you just glance ahead to the next passage, 18.6, who he refers to as these little ones, these nobodies, who have made themselves nothing in the eyes of the world by twisting themselves to Jesus and the church that he is building, if you are one of them, these nobodies, nothings in the eyes of the world, then you are in fact the son of a king. You belong to the king of heaven. When you pray your kingdom come, it's with delight and joy and longing. 
But if you are not one of them, if you have not yet put your faith in Jesus, you still belong, don't you, to the kingdom of earth. You still belong to the dying kingdom of death and taxes. The kingdom that is going to be replaced by the kingdom of heaven. You're still in the situation where God is not your father. And so your experience of life is going to be different, isn't it? This is the kingdom, isn't it, where glory and money and wealth are limited and finite. Where we have to jostle for rights and privileges and power. Where love and glory and wealth are, are limited resources. And so they have to be fought over. And if we're honest, actually, this is a miserable kingdom to belong to, the kingdom of men. And so if that's you, I just want to get you to, to think with us as we work our way through this passage, what is stopping you from putting your faith in Jesus? From putting your confidence in the King of Heaven? And we'll see before we finish this morning that you have every reason to do just like that. But look now what this means if you do belong to the King of Heaven in the second half of verse 26. Here is Jesus' conclusion. He says, then the sons are exempt. Now I want to press into that word a little bit more because it really is quite big. It's bigger than it's suggested here by the word exempt. The ESV, and in fact most good English versions, have it right when they translate the word as free. That is the word in the original, the sons are free. And so thirdly we come to the freedoms, the freedom of the sons of the king of heaven. So what does this freedom mean exactly? In what sense are the sons free? Well, in the immediate context, they are free not to pay the two drachma tax, which is why the NIV chooses that slightly mundane financial word, exempt. But in the bigger context, the context of the miracle and the context of the gospel and these two kingdoms, I think Jesus means something much bigger than exempt. He means the sons are free. He means the sons share that incredible, extraordinary freedom that is his as the king of heaven. This freedom is the security of belonging to a kingdom where wealth and honor and love and glory are not limited but are infinite. Well, what does this mean? Well, Jesus gives us a glimpse of how to enjoy that freedom back in chapter 6. You may Remember where he famously said to his disciples, you're going to be free from worry. He said, if you follow me and you put your little faith in your Father in heaven, you need not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what will you wear. And he said, look at the birds who your Father in heaven feeds and the flowers who your Father in heaven clothes. Isn't that a wonderful freedom? The utter freedom, the total security of belonging to a kingdom with lavish, inexhaustible supplies. A freedom that, as we've seen week after week, comes to us by Jesus' self-giving on the cross and his resurrection to God's right hand. I wonder if you've ever noticed that little bit in the middle of the Lord's Prayer Give us today our daily bread. It seems like such a materialistic line in an otherwise very spiritual prayer, doesn't it? But actually, I want to suggest the opposite is the case. Give us today our daily bread is the opposite of greed and hoarding, isn't it? See, if your father is the father in heaven, and he is busy clothing the birds of the field and feeding them every day, then give us today our daily bread means give us today exactly what we need. Here is a father who can provide a coin from a fish just when you need it. His bread will never run out. He has the entire world at his disposal. 
And of course, this is a freedom as well from sin and the consequences of sin, something expressed in the second half of the Lord's Prayer. We are free to forgive others because we have been forgiven ourselves. It's a freedom from fear. We need not worry and protect ourselves because we are delivered from evil. And above all, it's a freedom from the fear of death. To hear the call, pick up your cross and follow me, is to hear the call not from someone who wants to harm us, but from someone who wants us to live, from someone who is himself on the way to the cross and resurrection. And so what immense freedom belongs to you if you are the son of the king. But now comes the paradox. Now comes the twist. When Jesus, as he tends to do, just flips everything around for those who belong to the kingdom of heaven, because what are we to do with that freedom? We'll look again at verse 27. But so that we will not offend them, take the coin and give it to them for my tax and yours. Now, one of the advantages of preaching, as we do, consecutively through sections of the Bible, is we, we kind of learn the words that are key. And this word, offend, should ring some bells. We've seen it a number of times. In fact, it's a key word in Matthew's Gospel. And you may remember, if you, you were here right back at the beginning, that it's that word, scandalize, in the Greek. It means more than cause offense. It really means to put a trap, to put a block in someone's way, to cause someone to stumble. So it's not just to cause offense, but actually to stop someone believing in Jesus, to put a stumbling block in the way of faith. So we saw it in the very first week of the series when back in 1357, Jesus goes to his hometown and his people reject him and Matthew says they took offense at him. In other words, they, they, they stumbled over him. And it's a word we saw very powerfully as well in 1623 when Jesus called Peter a stumbling block for voicing Satan's opposition to his suffering. He said, Peter, you, in avoiding this, you are the stumbling block to me. And so to give offense is anything that causes people not to put their faith in Christ. And so here is the paradox, the the twist. Here is the paradox of Christian freedom. That we give up our freedom for the sake of others. See, this is what Jesus is demonstrating. Here is the king of all creation, the lord of his own temple. He does not owe the tax collectors anything. He is utterly free. And yet at the heart of this episode is his willingness to give up that freedom for the sake of others so that nothing will get in the way of them believing the gospel apart from the gospel him itself. And this is how we are to use our freedom too. One of the things that has helped me this week to understand this is to realize that it's actually, although it is the end of the action block, there are lots of connections between this section and the next little section that starts. And you'll see in verse 5 of chapter 18 that that scandal word comes up again. Whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. But if anyone causes one of these little ones to believe in me to sin, there's the word, it'll be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. To cause someone to sin, to put a scandal in their way, to cause them to stumble. To cause one of these little disciples, those who become nobodies in the eyes of the world, to stop having a reason to believe in Jesus. If anyone refuses to give up their freedom in such a way that causes them to stumble, then they're in danger of hell. And so here is a, a great paradox. The freedom of the Christian is immense. But our freedom is to give up our freedom for the sake of others. And that, I think, is what this 
strange little passage has to teach us. So let's reflect on this for a few minutes as we conclude. I've suggested that Matthew concludes this section this way because it's a brilliant little picture of the whole theme of this section going right back to chapter 13, which is this business of living in two kingdoms. On the one hand, there is the basic daily reality of the kingdom of men. We are part of it. We're born into it. We suffer it. We bear it. We contribute to it by our own life and by our own sin. This is our world, isn't it? The inescapable world of death and taxes. But as soon as you put faith in Christ, you belong at the same time to a bigger, better reality, the kingdom of heaven. And so we become free. We become truly free to live in this world in such a way that actually serves the kingdom of heaven. We become free to serve. We become free to sacrifice. We become free to die. And Martin Luther, in his work called The Freedom of the Christian, put it like this. He says, the Christian is a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. A Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. In other words, freedom for the Christian is to give up your freedom as a Christian because that is what Jesus did and that is how we become like him. See, Jesus is the king of heaven, but he's on his way to Jerusalem where he's going to give up everything for the sake of others. As Paul puts it in Philippians 2, he did not grasp the privilege of being equal with God, but he gave it up making himself nothing, taking the nature of a servant, humbling himself to death on a cross. And that's what he calls his disciples to do, to give up our rights, to deny ourselves, to take up our cross. This is our glory and our freedom. And I think this is immensely helpful and practical and countercultural. So just think about the, the way we normally live in the kingdom of men, we want to hold on to things, don't we? We want to protect ourselves. We want to grasp what is ours and make sure we come out on top. This is completely normal, isn't it? Think about when someone's rights are taken away. How loud the shouts become when our rights are denied. But the Christian is free to live differently. So if you're a Christian this morning, perhaps I can ask you to look ahead at your week. And you might be thinking about some of the hard things that you are facing. Some of the challenges. The things that God has put in your path. Maybe you feel a little bit daunted by them. Maybe you feel defeated by them. And maybe you can sense the battle already. But I think this passage is, to teach, is teaching us to think of those moments not as hurdles to avoid or battles to win, but moments when we get to express and enjoy our identity in Christ. Moments when we really do get to know that we belong to another kingdom. Moments to revel in your freedom as children of God, your security in Christ. So you are free to keep working at that difficult relationship. You are free to love that unlovable person at work or in your flat. You're free to stick your neck out in a conversation for Christ where you know you will look like a fool. You're free to keep laying down your life to be faithful in that difficult marriage. You're free to keep your commitments to that group or that meeting or that arrangement you're free to be tired you're free to be busy you're free to be stressed you're free to make yourself poorer free not to win every argument free not to take all your rights 
You're free not to be defined by your old self anymore. You're free not to be that grumpy, complaining person. You're free not to gossip. Free not to be bitter, if that's you. See how practical this is? We can leave all of that to the kingdom of men. Because in the kingdom of men, resources, love, glory, honor, they're all limited. And so everybody is busy elbowing and exploiting and competing and crushing, and they're as miserable as hell. Because they're slaves to self. But the children of the king are free. And as I've been working on this, I've been thinking, looking around at the church family and thinking, actually, this is what we see worked out in a church like this. Why do Christians impoverish themselves by being generous? Because they have to? Because there is some tax collector coming knocking? No, because they are free to. To apply Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount, why do Christians go the extra mile without being afraid of getting tired? Why do they give up their cloak without fear of being left naked? Why do they provide for the poor without fear of becoming poor? Why do they turn the other cheek without fear of getting hurt? Why do Christians forego rights and things that are theirs and their very lives? Because we are free to. Because that is our freedom. Very practical. Very challenging. But I want to suggest incredibly liberating too. But there is one more thing. And that is the very serious and sensible question of how do we know that this is the right way to live? How can we trust it? How can we believe Jesus? And if you're wondering about taking that step to put your faith in Christ for the first time, how do you know this is not a ridiculous thing to do? Well, two reasons. Firstly, look at the miracle. Here is a great act of God worked out for one person for one particular need. And we live in a world where a fish in the sea can spit out a coin that is needed. And so nothing you can give up for Christ will be lost. No, no cost that you can pay to be a Christian you will regret. But secondly, we know this is not ridiculous because this is what Jesus has done himself. And so we look back and we come back once again to the Christ crucified who proves his words by what he does. Because if you think about it, there is no greater picture of someone who is not free than a man hoisted on a Roman cross with nails driven through his hands and feet. There is no greater picture of someone enslaved by the kingdom of men. No greater picture of someone, a victim, defeated than somebody hung on a cross with nails through their hands. Betrayed, denied, deserted by his own disciples, skewered on a cross, robbed of all freedom of movement, pinned and powerless. But what we've seen is that this is the moment when Jesus was most free, most victorious, most glorious. The moment he chose the King of Heaven to give himself so that the sins of the world might be forgiven, so that those who put their faith in him now will share that glory and freedom forever. Well, let's pray that we might be among them.
Heavenly Father, we thank you again for what you've taught us through this part of Matthew's Gospel. We thank you that we've heard the call to take up our cross and follow Christ, that we might die in order to live. We thank you that glory comes through suffering. We thank you that while the world sees the good life in terms of gaining and acquiring, for Jesus' disciples, we've seen that giving is living. And most of all, we thank you that the glory and greatness and freedom of Jesus himself, that dazzling glory we glimpsed at the Mount of Transfiguration, is not revealed in victory and power and conquest, but in his loving self-sacrifice on the cross. And so we pray that we would put our little faith in him, that we might become children of the crucified and glorified King of heaven, so that we might revel in our freedom that is ours, by giving up our rights, our status, our life for the salvation of others. And as we do, may we look to the cross and see the glory that will one day fill the universe, that when your kingdom comes, your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray that day might come soon. In Jesus' name, amen.